Welcome to Digital Asset News. Take a top stories in crypto and bring out a bite-sized piece. As today, as the thumbnail suggests, I think it's a new year and a new outlook. And I think this is potentially the year for crypto moving into 2022. And what's going to push it is what is already here, institutional funds. So we're going to take a look at how hedge funds can actually compete. We're going to take a look at some stories about what could potentially make this and be a catalyst. We're also going to take a look at the flip side and the downside by taking a look at what's going on in El Salvador right now. And then finally, we'll take a look at uh, tax help and the Segevin figure house story. And as you can tell, we're in a little bit of a different place uh, as before for today's video. Uh, we've been slacking lately because we've had family in town and the holidays, but uh, that's uh, all over, unfortunately. And now it is back to the grind. So as you can tell, uh, this is uh, the new house here in Puerto Rico, and we're going to be doing a story. So wait till the end. I'll tell you exactly what's going on. But uh, to get going, let's talk about what's going on into the market right now. So today it is uh, the second. It is uh, almost 4 p.m. Uh, Guaynabo, Puerto Rico time. And it looks like uh, everything's holding kind of strong everything's kind of going sideways nothing's really happening because it's sunday it's sunday and we don't really have much going on i mean the only i think the big gainers right now i think we've got polka dot at 7.3 percent in the last 24 hours that's pretty good uh, avalanche up a percentage point and i think if i'm not mistaken chain link there he is uh, up almost nine percent in one day and i never understood why why chain link was so underperforming because it actually has real world utility i mean we need to pull in that outside data into the blockchain and without chain link it's it's one of those oracles that you really can't live without so it's always surprising me uh, just how uh, underwhelming it does but there is times when it breaks out and this is just one of those times so good day for that but to really dig into it and really talk about what's going on it really just comes down to uh, there was an interview and it was with uh, Anthony Scaramucci, the Mooch. And he's on, on the Real Vision Crypto, uh, Raul Powell's channel. And he's here to talk about his hedge fund, Skybridge, and how much he allocated to the fund as far as crypto. And he's kind of trying to weight different things. And it's amazing to me because he is just one of many, I think, that are, are going to come about. He talks about going from 4% to 20% and how that all happened. Just take a listen, it'll make a lot more sense in a second. So here's the irony, right? I put 4% of, not me, but my team, our team put 4% of our fund into Bitcoin in November, December of 2020. The coins were anywhere from 13 to 18,000 a coin. Uh, the coins now are 63,000. This is Bitcoin, of course. Bitcoin, the 4%, has grown and we've added to the position a little bit but roughly to 20 percent of the fund but it was so yeah 20 percent of the fund i think if you're talking about how funds can compete and actually do things i mean that's just a great story from uh, Anthony Scaramucci. And when people ask, well, who cares about Anthony Scaramucci? Well, remember, he's been in traditional finance for uh, quite some time. And uh, he's one of the founders of uh, Skybridge Capital. And I have to tell it's people like him, and then also people like Ray Dalio, who are thought leaders in that space. And I think when we start to hear these stories, it's not just us hearing these stories, because we don't care. We already know where things are going. We have to get everybody else underneath our tent. And these are the stories that kind of push those people or bring people uh, underneath. So this was a good one. And just very quickly, it states, this is Bridgewater Associates founder, Ray Dalio has clarified he's neither a raging bull nor a bear when it comes to Bitcoin. He holds some, he told them that, he told people that, hey, I hold some all the way back in May. Uh, the investor, Dalio agrees with fellow billionaire, Bill Miller, that one should allocate from one to 2% of his or her net worth into Bitcoin. Before we go on, Bridgewater Associates, first of all, what is that? What do they do? So Bridgewater Associates, uh, it's the firm serves institutional clients, including pension funds, endowments, foundations, foreign governments, and central banks. So if he's talking about, look, if we can just do one to 2% uh, and then allocate that into crypto or Bitcoin in particular, if we take a look at the retirement assets total, this is just in the US, I couldn't find anything globally. Uh, maybe someone can help me out. But uh, retirement assets is 37.4 trillion in the third quarter of 2021. And that's uh, Washington DC, December 16, 2021, 37.4 trillion. This is just for retirement assets. So we're talking about like one to 2%, we're like, eh, okay, that's nice, that's cute, that's adorable. But in all honesty, we have 
a retirement crisis. We have a pension crisis, and that's going on throughout the U.S. and globally. So the question is, well, how can you compete? Because, well, we'll get in that in a second. But first, I will just say this. Like, if we're talking about, like, the money that's out there, I mean, I talk about this all the time, but just look at the stock market. If he's, if Ray Dalio and Bill Miller are talking about like 1% to 2%, the stock market has about $100 trillion right now. Money supply is about $100 trillion, global debt, because global debt. Real estate, you're looking at $280 trillion, and then wealth is over 300 and then derivatives is like one quadrillion. So you got a lot of different uh, places to actually park your money into it. But then it comes down to this. Well, how can hedge funds compete? And why should they compete? Because this is why. This was from Tendies, and it talks about how only three hedge funds outperformed the S&P 500. If you don't know, the S&P 500 takes the 500 top companies and it's just a, uh, just a fund that you can invest into. And of course, as these companies uh, fall off or gain into, you start to invest into those. Now, of course, uh, you've got uh, the Facebook, the uh, Amazon, the Microsoft, uh, those different, uh, Google, those top five that take up like 20% or more, it's probably grown even more of the uh, total S&P 500. So what these hedge funds are doing is they're saying, look, you don't need a fund like that, which is super easy. You can, you can just do in a fund. What we're going to do is we're going to take your money, we're going to take your funds, and we're going to be able to uh, magically invest into all these different things, and we're going to have you a higher rate of return. Well, here's the problem. Uh, as of December 30, 2021, here's the information that we have. Only three hedge funds, three, have outperformed... <laughs> have outperformed the S&P 500. And if we put this down a little bit, the S&P 500, just so you know, uh, over the last uh, year has gone up almost 29% and had a monstrous year. Great year, right? But if we take a look at this here, uh, Seventh, Sem, Senvest, Impala, and SRS are only over that 28%. All the rest of these guys, you could have just done just fine investing in the S&P 500 and not paying these guys a bunch of different uh, money and funds. And there's a lot of different funds in here that didn't do too well. And actually even, even the Mooch was talking about Tiger Global and how they're diversifying, getting into these different funds and things like that. But even they only did 3% the year, 3%. That's not too great. So when we're talking about how these places can actually compete, yeah, they got to get into crypto. I, I'm not saying they have to. I'm just saying that it would probably be a pretty good idea to get them into crypto because if not, if I'm an investor and I'm like, what have you guys done for me? Because I mean, I can do this myself. I don't need you guys. I don't need a middleman to do this. And uh, I don't need you to get it into all these different funds because I know what to do because you are not doing the job that you're supposed to, which is out beating this, the S&P 500. Now, there's other people out there that don't really like investing into crypto, they don't really like uh, you know, having their cold storage. So I think we still need these types of places to really uh, bring them into crypto. But these types of things are what is going to bring the uh, investors into cryptocurrencies and digital assets. And then to finish this up, I will just say this. Uh, for me, what I'm gonna do is the, is the same thing for, throughout this year, I'm just gonna DCA in and out, buy the dip, hodl, but I'm going to do a little bit more of uh, gambling, not so much trading. Why not? I call it gambling, but there's some asymmetrical returns. I'm going to talk to you about products that I'm going to get into, and I'll bring you along for the ride. You don't have to invest into that because I'm not an investment advisor. This is just financial opinion, not financial advice, but I'm going to tell you a lot of things that I'm going to be doing and uh, bringing you into the things that I'm going to invest into, which are uh, some pretty um, cutting edge new uh, project. So let me just think about that in the comments section, and then let's uh, go on to the flip side, which is El Salvador, because everything sounds pretty good when we when we put it into a nice little package like that. But you got to always remember that for every moon boy out there, that's like it's only going to go up, it's only going to go up. You have to step back and just go. You know what? What is the flip side of this? Because I need to be prepared. This was an article that uh, just came out. That was pretty good. El Salvador's leader loved by crypto faithful, but not by bondholders. And before I get into this whole story, I'm just gonna scroll down to this very last point. And it states, uh, amid the collapse in bond prices, Bukele remains enormously popular at home. His approval rating is 85% in December, according to a poll by independent media outlet, 
LPG data. So when people are starting to talk about like, well, you know, he's very not too popular, he's gonna be out. I think he's gonna be in for quite some time. People seem to love him in El Salvador, uh, but I'm not El Salvadorian, nor do I live there. So if you have any other information, let me know in the comment section, even though it's kind of, it's kind of uh, opinionated if it's just one person, like I can just tell you right now, uh, half of this country hates the president, and the other half tolerates him, <laughs> and some people love him. So, I, I, and, I mean, if you got a poll, sure. Anyhow, but this is what's going on. The nation's overseas notes, this is for El Salvador, post the world's worst performance this year with losses approaching 30%, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. It's 800 million of bonds coming due in early 2023 and now priced below 80 cents in the dollar, signaling skepticism that holders will get paid back on time. Uh, Bukele has said he plans to issue $1 billion in 10-year bonds next year on Blockstream's liquid network for a yield of 6.5%. Seems like a pretty good idea, actually. Half of the proceeds would be used to buy Bitcoin. So it's all hinging on Bitcoin. And, there's a, and this is a, a statement from Jared Liu, money manager at William Blair Investment Management in New York. He says there's a good shot that he's able to get this done, and this is just going to embolden him even further. The path of getting paid back really relies on this model, and this model relies on Bitcoin prices. And there's one more thing I was thinking about when I read this. I was thinking about the El Salvadorian people because as they start to take in Bitcoin as payment on the Lightning Network, uh, they can immediately transfer it over to fiat. They can do that, but some people, I would assume some, not 100%, have left it into Bitcoin because they've heard about you know how great it is and the price appreciation. And if they've been doing that since the inception, they're probably not doing so great right now. I mean, maybe I mean, they're really, they really are dollar cost averaging, but last couple months have not been kind to Bitcoin. So if they've been holding, hopefully they understand that it's a, it's a long-term investment. But if it's just me and I'm in a third world country and I have to provide for my family, and this is the only way that I can do it, and I see a dollar worth of, worth of Bitcoin is now worth 76 cents, I'm like, whoa. Maybe this isn't uh, the greatest thing of all time. I mean, think of it this way. Even people in first world countries can't even get that straight. And they're like, wow, I just lost 5%. I got to start to cash out. So just, um, just take on the flip side and look at that. And I got to tell you right now, uh, the IMF and the central banks are desperately rooting against El Salvador. They do not want this to work whatsoever. So I'm saying that this is the year this has to, I feel like this is, it has to happen. Now, you can't stop the inevitable for what crypto is, but you can delay it. So let me just think about that in the comments section. And let's move on to our last piece, tax figure help. This one was actually pretty funny. This was uh, from Charles Hoskinson. And he states, uh, this is a meme. Hello, IRS. Uh, so my client bought $7,000 worth of cum rocket and staked it for three months. They're in 6,900% interest. They then sold and took the profits to invest in NFT titties. But the dev rugged the project and they only managed to liquidate 10% of the funds. Can the client deduct gas fees for the minting and balance out the short-term capital gains taxes from said cummies? Hello. And I thought it was funny. First of all, that's the first time I was able to read that without cracking a, cracking a laugh. But uh, <laughs> it, really is, it really is what it is because there's so much craziness out there. So if you're in the United States and you have to do taxes, like I'm gonna have to do taxes, I'm just gonna recommend CryptoTrader.tax. There is a link in the description. Looks just like this. And when you use that link, it gives you 20% off for, for CryptoTrader. I actually did a video too, as you can find there's a link right there that shows you exactly how to use it. From the time that I opened that up, I actually got the information in and was able to send it over to my accountant. It was 30 minutes. It's super simple. Also, if you use Voyager like I do, guess what? They have a direct integration now with Voyager. So if you're looking for an easy way to do your taxes, that is the one. And then lastly, to, to end this all up, there was a video that someone shared with me. It was uh, called Crypto Millionaires Are Flocking to Puerto Rico. And uh, I got to watch this great video from uh, Crypto Crow. Really good, really good video. It's him and his wife, and they talk about the pros and cons. Mostly, I mean, he's right. There's a lot, there's a, there's a lot of cons in Puerto Rico. I think even Puerto Ricans would, would agree with it. But uh, it's a pretty good place, and I want to talk to you about this house that we bought, which I'm gonna do this week. I'm gonna to talk to you about how I use the crypto uh, to for loans, uh, for the sale, for the down payment, uh, how it all took place over months and actually years to get this whole thing done. 
uh, because it's not just an overnight success. It actually takes a lot of time. And the reason why I'm talking to you about this house, it's not a flex on the house. Like, look at this. I got this great house and I'm in Puerto Rico. What it really comes down to is, is and I'll go into all this, is how it is up. You are the only person that you can count on. If you're watching this video, it's probably you against the world. So when we're talking about getting into crypto and making these types of investments, who else in your family is going to do it if it's not you? And when I talk about these things, I didn't, we didn't buy this house because it's just some place we want to lounge around in. This isn't 1950s when you do that. We bought this house for a specific purpose to do specific things. And we're doing these things to take care of our family and our friends and the people within our circle. Because again, if we don't do it, <laughs> ain't nobody going to do it. So really, it's you got to really put everything into it. Because if you don't, there's no one else that can do it for you. All right. So that's it for today. So look, if you liked today's video, found a little value, give it a thumbs up. Also consider subscribing. A lot of things we talk about are time sensitive and we're going to get even more time sensitive to talk about these new projects. But that's it for today. So thanks so much. We'll improve on the audio and the visual later. I appreciate it. See you in the next one.